Women Matters, the international women's group of the Wisdom Factory. And today we will do the third session about healing. The first one was the healing of Haneli. You are look perfect. You would never think that something had happened to you. The second one was about our healing modalities, what we think about how we can self-heal. And today, Christine suggested, what is the difference between healing and transformation? So we will have a look on that. First, as always, a little check in the weather for, not forecast, the weather report from our country. <laughs> Inside and outside weather report, okay? Uh, who wants to start? I would say Mar Mar Victoria Martino, because she is unmuted. So you can just start. Oh, oh I didn't even know I was. Um, uh -huh. I'm in New York City. And um, it yesterday it snowed, but you can't see the snow, but I'll show you the buildings. Can you see the building? Yes. Well, not probably not very well. Um, I'm up on the the ninth floor. Um, and I have come here to see Beatrice. And of course, ironically, Beatrice can't join us this morning. <laughs> um, but I saw her last night for dinner. So I think I guess that's supposed to count. Um, she sends her love and her regrets. She she made two trips in the last um, two weeks, and she's really exhausted. So I've barely seen her. Um, it snowed yesterday. That was really exciting. Um, I love snow to death, and um, and it was just it was just magical, of course, because the the all the trees with the snow on the on the bare branches, and I gave my first Mondrian lecture last Tuesday. So it's this is the first time in my life that I love winter. Coming here to New York and seeing all the trees with the bare branches, I used to really hate it because I love leaves and especially autumn leaves with all the different colors. But thanks to Mondrian who, you know, progressed from gorgeous trees to more and more abstract images. Finally, it was just geometry. Um, now I have this new appreciation for geometry. So it was, I don't know, it was just very exciting to see. And the snow of course outlined all the forms, the verticals and horizontals. So, um, and I just ate a massive Valentine's Day breakfast, but banana, there's a famous banana pudding place in New York that I love to death. It's just heavenly. Um, and some chocolate no flour cake that reminded me of Vienna, my favorite cake at Damel's. So, so I'm totally happy and filled with um, calories and good cheer. So I will <laughs> pass it on to Hanali, who is laughing appreciatively <laughs> and you I like I like your pink outfit for Valentine's Day <laughs> thank you oh you really my beloved full of calories <laughs> uh, thank you so much yeah in South Africa it's Africa it's warm it's like midsummer really humid really hot the last few week, uh, days and um yeah also in South Africa Almost, almost all the COVID regulations has been taken away. So it's almost really back to almost normal. And um, yeah, so it's very interesting to see people. You can feel it in, in, the, in the collective consciousness, more a sense of freedom and the likes. Um, yet still be a little bit cautious, obviously. I myself, I'm really grateful for being in this state currently and um, still also feeling back my way into life after January. And so I love the topic. It's really, thank you, Christine, it's really lovely. And I've also been, um, because of what happened, I was, the things that I wanted to do, I couldn't do at the time. And I didn't want to at the time, I wanted to really focus on my healing process. And now I'm ready to do that. So I'm really excited. I'm busy recording um, three uh, multimedia series on how to, how can we make the transformation from inequality, um, the, whole the, the, the whole diversity, equality and inclusion discussion to, to something different, as well as how can organizations transform and actually transcend from profit and loss to flow and flourishing. So I'm making a multimedia series around those two topics. 
And it's fun because I'm really challenging leaders to think differently. And I love doing those type of things in a very naughty, playful way. So I'm really excited for that. And last week I also, after my, it was the first time that I really did a public workshop online, a big one about leadership intelligence. And it was really fulfilling to prepare for it, but also to facilitate. So I'm really grateful to be here with you girls today. And I'm passing it on to Gitrout. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Gertraud from Germany in the middle, right in the middle, north of Frankfurt. And um, oh, there's a lot going on, becoming a grandmother again, uh, selling a house, which is an ongoing story. And, and I'm working on two different layers, one in a company and one with a group of individuals with appreciative inquiry. So, so there is a lot, lot going on. And I finished my training, the WeFlow training. So I'm on my way to be certified. That's, that's really nice. <laughs> and um, yeah, there's a weekend coming up uh, that I'm facilitating. That's one of the criteria. Um, yeah, it's so like, <laughs> but there is, um, what I realized was uh, when we come to the healing part, I think there was a lot of healing in, in the, the last months and quarter, last quarter of, of last year. And I feel so differently though I do similar um amount of work so it's not the work itself it's not the time itself that it's it's more if there's more space inside and more yeah a lot of healing has taken place and and so i've sometimes i'm sitting there and they I don't have to do anything. <laughs> so it's like, oh my God. And, and last year I, I couldn't even think beyond doing. So, or I have to, or I should, why didn't I? And I have to be different and things like that. So I feel more comfortable in my skin this year. That's really nice. And Beatrice, hi. <laughs> I pick you. <laughs> so to hi. Be next. <laughs> I I'm not sure if I can stay for the whole whole thing today. Um, I just got back from. Well, I'm calling in from New York, <laughs> but I actually wasn't in New York for the last ten days. Um, I was in Florida for a week and then I went to the Dominican Republic for a weekend. <laughs> um, it's been quite a whirlwind. Um, went for a wedding, went to Disney World to visit a friend who works there. Um, I met uh, a woman who knew my father when he did an exchange year uh, in Mishawaka, Indiana. He was the only, the very first exchange student in this tiny, tiny town um, in 1952 and one of the friends he made there, her name is Sherry and um, they were very close. And I think he had, he had a crush on her. He wanted to date her, but he was only there for a year. And then he went back to Austria and from 1953 until 1993, um, they wrote letters to each other. And um, anyway, so I'd never met her before. I went to meet her cause she lives in Florida and I was in Florida and she gave me a stack of all the letters that he wrote to her in those decades. So I'm gonna go through them and read them. I read the first one, which is very cute. You know, my father was 18 and ha had already forgotten some of his English and was misspelling words. And it, he, was writing, he was writing in February, it was Fashing. And he was writing about how he had been dancing all night and he was up until four in the morning and he was never home except when he got sick because he was out so much dancing. And I thought, oh, that sounds familiar. <laughs> I'm just like that. Um, 
anyway, so that was a lovely little thing. And then I came back to New York for about, I don't know, 12 hours and then turned around and went to the Dominican Republic with the family that I work for um, and spent the days at the beach and the pool with the little four-year-old. Um, so it was a work trip, but it was also, you know, in the sun and palm trees and eating delicious fruits. And, you know, I had a pineapple and it felt like I've never eaten a pineapple before because it tasted so delicious and so different from the pineapple I usually eat. Um, yeah, I got back Saturday. Um, settling back into New York. My mother's here. I don't know if she's checked in yet. She's visiting. She's up on the Upper West Side and I'm down in Brooklyn, but we saw each other last night for dinner. <laughs> oh, I've got mine here. Where is it? <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I don't know. I just came from dance class and I feel great. This morning I felt really exhausted and I've been going and doing and socializing and doing all kinds of things for so many days in a row that I think it'll hit me <laughs> soon. Oh, and I'm starting a new job this week. Um, <laughs> on Wednesday, I am uh, starting a new job at uh, the church where I'm helping with their education program. Um, and that's exciting. Um, what else? I didn't get the apartment that I applied for. That's okay. I'm, I'm, I'm going to stick around here for a while and try to make this a good home. Um, so that's it. Those are my updates. I just dropped up my heart, <laughs> my heart squish. Um, <laughs> all right. Who, who hasn't gone? Some, somebody want to wave to me? I can call on you or am I the last? Oh, okay. Christine West is apparently we say now. Good morning. Um, I'm Christine from Carlsbad, California. That's Southern California. Um, yeah, today's Valentine's Day, which is very nice. Got some flowers and uh, affection. It's always nice to start the day that way. Um, and uh, not much else happening. Yesterday was a busy day. Uh, in the United States, we watch the Super Bowl and it's almost like a holiday if you like football, which I do. So um, that was a fun day, had a nice weekend. Um, Saturday, Jeff Salzman, if, if those of you who know Jeff Salzman, he was uh, uh, speaking at San Diego Integral and um, that was a nice event. We had a lot of people uh, in attendance from all over the world. And for the first time, I found out what it is when people, what are they called when people bomb your Zoom sessions? Bombers? I don't know what they're called. But <laughs> we had some people doing that uh, at the beginning. And it took, a, it took a while for the host to figure out how to get rid of them. But, so that was an experience. Um, very annoying. Um, and two weeks from now, I will not be here. I am going to Florida and uh, have waited two years to celebrate my sister's 70th birthday. She's now 72, <laughs> but we've had a tradition uh, at 70 years old uh, with the siblings getting together and celebrating. So after two years of uh, pandemic, looking forward to going there and being with my brother and my sister and my sister-in-law. Um, Tom is opting to stay home because he doesn't trust his uh, the recovery of his knee quite yet. He doesn't walk very, he walks, but he doesn't walk very far and doesn't keep up with people all that well yet. So he's going to stay home. Um, yeah, but I'm looking forward to that. And we're thinking about what kind of things uh, we want to do. I haven't been to Florida since college. I uh, used to go there for spring break um, every year. And so I'm looking forward to, uh, to going back and seeing it again. Um, yeah. So I will miss you guys, but I'll probably be on a plane uh, at the time that we otherwise would be meeting. So I will turn it over to uh, Christine East. Thank you, Christine West. <laughs> okay, I'm not mute. Okay, I'm on a mute. Um, gosh, what? It feels like it's just been moments since we last met. It's just all, a little bit of a haze for me. 
Um, mainly a haze because I've been spending quite a bit of quiet time making a transition with actually the book had its first, my book had its first edition. I think I mentioned before that I'm working on the second edition and it's just gotten more and more complicated in terms of the technology. So I've kind of had to withdraw and ask new questions of how can we make this easier? And so I've got some people who are helping me with that. And it's kind of like being, feeling really out of control and it's got its own life. And I think that's part of the honoring of it. And maybe if we're thinking about transformation and healing, I think maybe the book is wanting to do that. There's some things that I have to add, some things to subtract. And um, the back side says, no, you can't do that. So maybe that happens sometimes with healing and transformation. You hit a wall and it says to you, do not enter. You can't do this. So I, I guess it's kind of, it's a real humble process. So I don't really, usually I like to use my intuition and just completely follow my intuition. And usually things evolve more comfortably. So I think it's a good reminder right now to say that, and to hear that voice inside me go, yeah, you know, that that's really what is needed. So just trust that um, I might not even be able to imagine what's next in order to get it up there. And I have to let go of time. I thought, well, in a month it would be great. And then I can be free to do some other Enneagram things. I do have a workshop that I'm facilitating in a couple of days, so that's getting, some of my attention. Um, and then I've got projects going on in the house. I've got a separate apartment downstairs, which sort of is like kind of a part of a retreat. So some people can be here and but yet not be in the main part of the house. And I've got someone coming in about an hour to work down. So I'm, I'm just so being classically doing. <laughs> maybe, maybe, um, that's why it sort of feels like a haze. Like maybe I've thought that I was kind of withdrawing from the world a little bit, but I'm withdrawing in order to get these things done. And I guess I feel some accomplishment there, which is and it's satisfying and it's exciting, especially if I just stay completely open, not trying to um, picture the way the house project is going to unfold or the book or anything, but let it show me. And I think maybe that's close to what healing sometimes is for me to show me, show me where, show me what that is. What are the sensations of healing? So that's, that's my, um, that's where I am in this moment, those sensations, because it's always the body that knows. It was my body that knows. And so this thing is not very clever at all. <laughs> so, good to be together. I pass it on too, right? Who has not gone yet? Atini? Monia as well and Heidi as well. Hello, everybody. Uh, happy Val Valentine. Um, I am from uh, Kritzendorf, close to Vienna. And uh, it was a beautiful day today, warm, nice. I was swimming. Um, and I have thinking of you uh, who were just looking at birds and um, the, the little um, um, animals who are jumping from one tree to the other tree, it is a I don't know the thing. Squirrel. A squirrel, yeah. And uh, we can watch them. And I did quite a lot of um, something for my body, for the weight. But it's uh, the food is beautiful and uh, it is winter and I'm like a hamster. Uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. It's okay. And I um, got a very nice book. Monia has it as well. From the open, from the openness to the openness. And this in Dutch, 
in, in my own language. It is such a beautiful thing for me because I haven't, um, uh, I don't speak so much uh, Dutch. And at that time when I lived in Holland, I was not aware of this beauty. And now I can read it in my own language. It is so beautiful. Oh, it's it's uh, all poems for me. So, uh, and I'm combining it with my pictures, what you are doing, Christine. But uh, yeah, I have a lot of fun. I, I'm doing nothing. But this is um, uh, uh, becoming to the uh, uh, core, coming to the core of the self. And I, I, I really like it because I don't know what I'm doing. It is just happening. And that's fine. So, Moria, uh, I give over to you. Thank you. Well, uh, <laughs> I'm somewhat in a similar situation. And sitting and breathing is just enough for me. Uh, on the other hand, <clears throat> it's cold. It's sunny and cold. And so I envy any, everybody who is going to Florida or like Hanili being in the summer. Um, and we do have lots of squirrels and birds. And since it's Valentine Day today, I didn't get flowers. I got the new mattress for my bed. So, uh, and I guess it will help my back and it's, I've been all right now so for the last two weeks. Um, but ev any healing is a transformation and uh, I'm glad we picked this topic today. Uh, I'm also <clears throat> trying to get rid of old concepts. I uh, found the books of uh, Rüdiger Dahlke. I don't think he was translated into English because he clings so much to the German language and he explains any disease you have according to German. So it's obviously a German disease book. And I found it's, uh, it, uh, it's probably the reason he was never translated into English, but he's so sure of himself and I saw him on YouTube uh, explaining uh, Corona and knowing it all. So I really decided to get these books off my shelf. And it's, it's sort of a satisfaction I have because it's very, very male and male approach. Yeah, so I enjoy sitting and breathing and doing nothing and being done. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's see what our topic will bring. Heidi, I'll pass on to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, what's about me? I think that the days pass without me noticing. I mean, I notice it, but let's say in this way, I notice it, oh, it's already evening, you know, in this way. So pass fluently and I see the people and I think I have seen them already today, but it was yesterday. So it's, it's sort of a continuous <clears throat> flow, which is nice, but also a little bit strange. Uh, about healing, I have heard a lot of um, what you were saying, what you are thinking that healing is in your own context. You know, uh, many of you gave uh, some, some hint about how you feel good at the moment or satisfied or whatever. And for me, this is part of healing, no? to be in a positive mood in a positive way. So I'm wondering, Monia says all healing is transformation. Uh, transformation for me doesn't necessarily mean, trans mean transformation into good. It can also be into something else. So maybe we should a um, little bit define what, what we understand about uh, transformation and how we connect it to, to healing in our own view. Christine West, I, I see that you are looking so interested. Maybe you have an idea. <laughs> I 
<laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not even, I guess it's, I do have a question about it. Are they synonymous or does one stage of healing automatically flow into some kind of transformation? It's more of a question as opposed to the, whether I have a knowing about that. Um, I'm reading an interesting book uh, called An Interrupted Life. And it is about Eddie Hillesum. Hillesum. She's a Dutch woman during uh, World War II. Um, and kind of like Anne Frank, she kept a diary and letters. And um, the book is about her healing from her family that she grew up in, which was very chaotic and disruptive to her, uh, didn't have much of a sense of self or who she was. And as an adult, she did heal from that. Um, and her transformation was one of spirituality. I mean, that's kind of the focus of the book uh, as she ends up you know, being persecuted by the Nazis and all of that. But um, it's interesting for her, the healing definitely led to her transformation. And my sense, I guess, Heidi, that's interesting that you say it can, it's not always a positive thing. And I, I would agree, um, but I'm thinking of transformation as more of an integrated self. Um, and I'm thinking even in larger terms, if we think about the environment and what are we trying to do to heal you know, a very unhealthy world uh, and environment, um, climate, uh, it's gotta be, it's gotta change. It's gotta be transformed. There's at many levels, there's gotta be transformation in order for the healing to occur. I don't think it can heal without some degree of transformation uh, and people doing things differently. So I don't know, they do seem to go hand in hand, but, um, as we talk, I'm also gonna think maybe of, of situations where they're not necessarily connected, where some healing can occur, but it doesn't necessarily change the person or, or change uh, their sense of self or change the world. Heidi, would you be willing to say more about how transformation may not be preceded by healing and can be, what, what would precede transformation that's negative, like it wouldn't be healing, what might it be? Oh, I think about disaster can bring a transformation into, into horrible things, you know? So transformation in itself not has nothing positive or negative as a word, but as we understand it, it's more, as you say, no? Maybe a spiritual way of becoming more whole, you know? But just I wanted to clarify this a little bit because it often uh, the many terms are used and we are, don't even know how we, <laughs> what we understand under these terms. So I invite everybody to say their ideas about healing and transformation and their, not only ideas, also experiences. I wonder, Haneli, with your healing process, I think you have already had many transformations in your life as far as I know you. And uh, is this an, an, another one, what has happened? Yeah, it's very interesting. I should speak about, before I will speak about myself, I'll just speak about something that came up when I prepared for the Leadership Intelligence Workshop. Uh, I love the work of Brian Schwimm. He's a, a, he's a mathematical cosmologist and he works with the powers of the universe. And it, it, if, you, if you look at them, it really is what we actually experience in life as well. So they're not different, in, especially in the way he, his research has and his curiosity has brought it about. And part of the process is both transformation and transmutation. And in terms of the powers of the universe and the way he speaks about it and his work, his life's work, is transmutation, transmutation is the change of the individual so it's the self so it's the self becoming whole and the wounded parts then healed 
uh, and transformed into that wholeness. I love the word that you use, the whole self. And, I, and, and for me, it's wholeness, to become whole. And then transmit, transformation in the way he speaks about it in terms of this power of the universe is that the ability of the whole to transform, to change. But the transformation, the transmutation of the self must happen before the whole can really heal because otherwise the parts will not, you know, there will be no harmony, no coherence. So it even makes logical sense if you look at it that way. So to transform the whole, the self must be looked after first in the way he speaks about it. And in terms of wholeness, my own experience now, I've been, I've been sensing deeply into what was happening to have a deeper understanding of, of what, what, not so much why it happened, but what's happening in me. And I said to my daughter actually on the weekend that I discovered that even me eating now is very different. I eat for a very different reason because at the time I was eating to heal my body uh, when it, the incident happened. So, and now that's continuing. So I, of course I'd love to enjoy food because I love food. I mean, it's the beauty of the earth nourishing us. But it's different for me now. Something has changed my body as well. So it's like there was a kind of a mutation or a transmutation happening in my body, in myself specifically. But now when I eat and when I decide what to eat, I'm really listening to my body a lot more than before. So it's not a mental thing. It's really my body's guiding it. So there's that impulse that, and I don't want to call it the instinct, but there's this impulse, eat this now, eat that now. And me listening to that inner voice of my body. It's not even my intuition. So that's definitely happening. And, as, and when that was that incident happened, I was shouting out things <laughs> that I thought I healed to myself and like things from my past. And I realized I worked on these things so many, on so many different layers and levels. And yet I had to express that in such, you know, in that moment when it happened because of the shock of, to my body and my being that I expressed it verbally. And then to realize, but I haven't necessarily yielded that on all levels. So there's probably still a little bit that I need to take care of. So the two is going hand in hand of the physical healing and then emotional healing in, in my case on that level. In terms of transformation, transformation for me has always been associated with the butterfly of the caterpillar eating, eating one, even in the way we learn and the way we, we want to uh, get more knowledge. It's not only consuming things, but we become like the caterpillar. We want to know more and more and more. And we can do that even when we, on our spiritual paths, in our personal growth, we can do the same. This workshop, that workshop, this workshop, that workshop, this retreat. And we become a consumer of spiritual knowledge. We not necessarily apply it or integrate it or embody it. And then we go into the cocoon phase where it's almost like we're getting ashamed because we ate so much. And now we have to spend time in a cocoon that we can, that all this can integrate and transform, that this beautiful being can be birthed. But the butterfly didn't know the caterpillar. It's completely two different beings, creatures, so to speak. So for me in transformation then is to really let go of that old mindset, that old ways, and which is still part of healing too for me. So I don't, I, for me, it's the energy behind them that's more important than the actual words. But in that process, there's natural, there's, it, there, there are these wounded parts of ourselves that are healed anyway, as when we, especially when we're in the cocoon and that, that mushy stuff starts happening, that we have, that we can, and it's even if you look at birth, birth is a messy thing. And it's painful, but look at the beautiful creature coming through that birthing channel. So again, there is, like you said earlier, it doesn't necessarily, it's not always a nice feeling, a good feeling, but they, they, they could be anguish related to it as well. But look at what's coming out of the process. Or that's, yeah, the fruit of, even if you look at a seed in the soil, it transforms many, many times in different forms before it shoots through the soil, become the seedling and become the plant and then to bear fruit or flowers. And each of those processes for me is a, is a state of transformation by itself. So we can look at it for me from different angles in different ways. For me, definitely what happened in or what I went through rather, let me rather explain like that, 
There is both. There is definitely both because suddenly I'm also looking at life differently on a different level. And even when I'm doing things, there's a deeper question of why am I doing it? So there's definitely something that happened there and that's still happening, obviously, um, because it's so recent. But so it's a, it's a both and it's not either or for me. Thank you. It's interesting because um, one of the things I've been involved with the last five weeks, it just ended yesterday, um, every Sunday, was a, an experimental research think tank about uh, grief and mourning. And I was invited in to participate. And one of the things that came up, and it was, it was kind of like this, where, where the research was coming through conversation and shared wisdom and people bringing in experiences and resources and uh, collectively kind of coming to some ideas and wisdom and research together. Um, and one of the things that came out of our discussions was that one of the reasons it's so hard to grieve is that people don't acknowledge you as transformed, that grief transforms you and changes you. And that there's this, this both and like you're saying too, of wanting to be seen and acknowledged as the same person, but also wanting to be seen and acknowledged as someone who is fundamentally changed to the core because of the loss that you've experienced. And um, so transformation was something that came up a lot in our conversations. The other thing that came up, I mean, the other things that seem to be circling in this conversation too, um, were about, you know, time and nonlinear time and, um, you know, what past and present and future and how they all kind of blend together and develop together. And, and it's not, you know, things transform and change differently over time. Um, and the third thing is, is third thread that I'm picking up here is the embodied piece. Um, a lot of our research also involved um, tapping into sensations and connecting with each other physically. Um, and we were on Zoom, but um, you know, we did we did a ritual on yesterday to con conclude our our sessions together by um, all eating together and doing a meditation on the sensations of the food, um, and we also did some physical things together. But but what we were lost a lot of that we were also talking about how much knowledge is stored in the body and how much you already know in your body, and how often we ignore it because we are so focused on the mind. Um, and the intellectualization and the solution finding and, and all of that, right? That um, we lose touch of this, this huge resource of knowledge and wisdom and expression and development and transformation. Um, so I guess I'm just yes, saying yes and <laughs> to everything that you said, Hanali, and to what everyone's saying in the space that it's, it's not dualistic. And it's not linear, and and it and it also goes on forever. <laughs> it's 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 not inside of time either. Yeah. Well, I was going to say what you what you said at the beginning, Heidi, about um, how transformation is not necessarily positive or negative is is a very important piece of it that, um, and that the, my experiences in life have been that my greatest lessons have been learned in the most agonizing circumstances. That in my greatest times of suffering and loss and grief, I have really grown. And in my times of, of just um, happy-go-lucky, like today, um, eating the banana pudding, um, <laughs> 
I mean, I, I, I don't think I, I, I am transforming because I certainly gained a few pounds, but, um, <laughs> but I think that it's, it's amazing how in the, in the good times, I just feel like I, I'm just enjoying myself, but I don't feel like I'm necessarily becoming wiser or I'm definitely not becoming wiser about the banana pudding. Um, and so it's the suffering that interestingly enough, I think so, so many people misunderstand the spiritual path because they think of these, you know, sort of the, the stereotypes of the self-flagellating monks and all these kinds of things and the austerity of living um, a life of, you know, celibacy and renunciation and all of these things. But, but I have seen how without even, you know, planning things like that, I have my own uh, experiences of deprivation and loss have been the, the crucibles where I have been um, transformed like transformed in fire. I mean, it's a crucible where I come out refined, um, sort of all the dregs and the dross fall away. And, and hopefully I'm like being gradually being transformed into the best version of myself. So I think that's a that's something our culture really wants to deny, and I think part of the um, denial of death in our culture, I'm talking about our, our Western culture because it's not denied. I think in other cultures, it, I think that's a big piece of it that it's people want to pretend that there's they're in denial about suffering of any kind, and death is they consider the ultimate suffering because partially because it's a complete mystery. So. Um, Anyway, that's what I, I think what you said, Heidi, was very um, apropos to that, that way of looking at transformation. I'll just jump in quickly to say that um, in a recent session, one of the people in, in this think tank said, quoted um, a podcast with an interview with Thich Nhat Han, where he said that, and I'll heal up exactly what's it. Um, that he didn't want to live in a world without suffering because suffering is what makes us want to grow and do better and learn and that without suffering we would be frozen um so just that feels connected i see martini had her mic open so pass back to you coming to the roots. Mm. Um, and experience uh, joy and pain or suffering. Um, if we are looking from the roots, then um, there is a possibility that we are, uh, not that we don't feel it, but we are beyond the, the suffering, beyond the, we just can accept it. And I think this is a beautiful transformation. And we suffer with the people if they suffer worldly, and um, then, um, oh, I, I, I don't really can explain it. Or, or uh, I missed when I suddenly had the, um, the and, and then Beatrice uh, talked and I, I, I lost my spontaneity, but it, it comes back and, and I, uh, we'll uh, jump in when another time I try to jump in, okay? I'm wondering, because it was said, uh, the caterpillar doesn't know the butterfly. So I wonder, does the butterfly remember the caterpillar? What do you think? Because uh, one of my favorite books was The Very Hungry Caterpillar, who eats itself through every day of the week, through more and more and more and more. 
So that's the way of the caterpillar. And of course you have to go into the silence and the quietness and the cocoon. So one of the questions maybe we could discuss sometimes is how do we cocoon? What is our cocooning like? Are we aware that we are cocooning? Are we aware that it's necessary to cocoon? And yeah, and there's, there's still the question, does the butterfly remember the caterpillar? I wonder. Hmm. Now, now we're really getting philosophical. <laughs> it's a question of consciousness, huh? What kind of consciousness is occurring? Um, but as people were talking, I was thinking also substituting the word healing, perhaps for wisdom. So that, you know, with suffering and loss and grief, the path to transformation may not necessarily be a healing of things because that kind of implies putting things back together, which cannot happen in the state of, of grief, but um, perhaps wisdom is a different way of saying healing. And it's not, I'm not sure if caterpillars or butterflies are that wise, but human beings are. Some, some. Do you feel that you are now in the caterpillar stage or in the butterfly stage? Christine Est wanted to say something. <laughs> yeah, I'm intrigued with you know the semantics of this. It's it's powerful. Um, and some of the words take us into our bodies, and some words take me more to my head. And the idea of Remembering, I associate with something that's conscious, that's somehow in a thinking process. But my heart tells me, and my fascination with anthropology is that at some level, our, our cells remember everything. I deeply believe that with all my heart. So I say, yes, the caterpillar remembers. But the caterpillar doesn't process information like we do, that maybe their, their evolution is being processed in some way with the choices that they make. You know, I'm, I'm intrigued by the three kinds of instincts that, that I study in relationship to how the Enneagram deals with um, instincts, the self-preservation, the sexual, and those three categories. And we have DNA in all three of those categories, but do we really? I don't know. But it's something to be curious to honor. To be, it's a gift, I guess. It's a spiritual gift that we have all this information in our being. And how we access it is um, a marvelous question. Yes, Heidi, you started to say yeah. something. Yeah, you were breaking up and I wondered if it was only for me or also for other people, was also for you, that this, the sentence you said before uh, was uh, sort of ununderstandable. I wonder the if there's something wrong with my connection, do you think? It just, just explain the last uh, argument again and so. Uh, could you start at uh, three kinds of, uh, what was it? Uh, Instincts that so self preservation, sexual, and social. Social, that was the, this. Yeah, was it the, started the, there. It started there, the breaking up series. Mm -hmm. That's interesting that it broke there, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I think we can take that as a healing transformation, receiving that. <laughs> maybe that wasn't that, maybe keeping it simple that I, my bias is that we, at some level, ourselves remember everything. Some neuroscientists are leaning in that direction, the very first forms of life that then formed another one and another one that we are still connected to that. And if neuroscientists 
be curious about that. I'm sure our spiritual beings are wondering how do we put this how do we put this together? I'm very interested in what others of us think because I have a um, I love knowing that once upon a time, for millions of years, all of this has just moved towards more complication. And less from simple cells to these incredibly complex things. And it's gonna keep on going. Whatever is happening with artificial intelligence is going to be a pretty big thing. Um, before I was, I was God in God, and now I can be again if my, I, Martini, am dead, but dead in the moment that I am uh, in connection with all the roots of everything. And uh, this is the, the feeling of the the thousands of years before and the moment of today. So there is so, such a beautiful connection. And if we become quiet, we experience it. And, and we don't have to do anything. Uh, you wrote it, Hanali. Uh, it the universe is coming to me and brings what I need in this moment. Maybe I cannot prove it now, but I experience it with such an, an balance throughout the day. And this is a, a, a very satisfying um, uh, being. And I never knew that such a thing uh, is possible. It is um, uh, I am at this <laughs> at the moment. Uh -huh. I cannot uh, uh, explain it anymore. I, I think you helped me to uh, just bring those few words. Thank you. That's so beautiful. And it just reminds me of one, and that is belonging. We have that in this group. And I think when we that ourselves remember everything from the beginning, Maybe that's a belonging to that may not be in this thing, which isn't really as smart as sometimes we think it is. Western culture tends to put so much attention on the mind, the brain. But I do think we are more as we know that we are. I really believe that. And this is why we can be very satisfied with who we are. And if we accept ourselves like that, then we can change our little surrounding. And, and the little surrounding can carry it on. Uh, and, and this is a very slow but and, and beautiful process to change the world. And, but it is not um, um, uh, noisy. It is quiet. But it happens. It is there. And we, we experience it. And this is the joy. And the joy is the spontaneous being whatever was there that is we are invited to play here on the earth and it is it is a gift thank you Ringet, how you said last time that you have to to go away more or less on the hour is it still for today do you want to no it's vice versa i i I have a oh, okay. Um, so I come in 
maybe a few minutes later. So okay, anyway, it's, it's, it's your space now. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm. Um, it's amazing how we meander through this topic it's uh for me there were words coming up like empathy empathy is neutral as well so it's just the the capability of getting the 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 what's in the room <laughs> what's with the other person and there are some very famous uh fictions uh, uh with a murderer <laughs> being very <laughs> empathetic <laughs> and, and really getting into the into their victims um so in transformation and healing for me it's really like um it, as if we're talking about different states of the same thing so like um Healing is more like somebody is not healthy and 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 getting this in a wholesome way healthy again, or what we were talking about in transformation is more the process, what happens in the process of healing. So it's not it's not the the product or the what the outcome it's more what's happening while going this way or while healing so that there were a lot of thoughts coming through and then somebody else gra <laughs> grabbed the mic so um and i was the this this um this quote, I don't want to live in a world of suffering. Uh, for me, it's it's yes and. So to say, um, to, to try to exclude suffering will cause suffering. <laughs> so will cause people not being able to, to process it, to heal and, and um, and at the same time, it, uh, when I'm thinking of some some other work, there is something like we think we have to suffer in order to to proceed, in order to transform, and and this is also not true. So it, it it's kind of transformation or healing can only take place through suffering is not true either so so for me it's it it's not to exclude it and not to negate it and things like that and to find a way how how, how can i um grow how can i be healed how without necessarily go through suffering but when it occurs it's welcome so I, I mean this is something yeah some thoughts that came to my mind it's not not an answer to anything <laughs> it's just just this yeah to be in flow and be in in yeah where where i leave the caterpillar and and there's something that this this yeah there's a liquid or something that is not structured and and then it transforms into into something more beautiful but yeah it's both and not either or <laughs> It's interesting, the conversation is almost taking a tone of light and dark, you know, uh, shadow sides of suffering and grief and the difficulty, the struggle of, of healing and, and change, as well as trying to emphasize the, the more positive growth oriented uh, sides of it. So it's, I just hear that theme kind of coming and going in various ways. 
you know, is, is this a light process? Is it a dark process? Is it, is, does it have to be both? That Does it have to be uh, one or the other? I appreciate so much that you say that because it probably is from my experience, just both and. And there's awe, incredible awe moments that are that they're transforming. And then the, I'm just thinking about what Victoria mentioned, some of the most painful things in her life. Those extremes take us to to see differently. And I think that's something to embrace. I like the way you, you put that for us, kind of like pulling it together. Maybe it's it's the disruption that occurs. I'm just wondering. In both end. <laughs> I think it's disruption. Oh, excuse me. Being unsettled, is that what you meant, Gertrude? That disruption, kind of the unsettled? Yeah, a kind of when we talk about this this uh, caterpillar it's it's like disrupting the old and it doesn't mean it has to be suffering but disrupting the old in a way that you cannot go back like with the 13th door once opened you cannot have not seen that that painting or whatever yeah. that was what I wanted to say uh, yeah, that maybe it's coming out of the habitual way of living and waking up in some way, if it is spiritual or in some other way, but it's like oh, you open the eyes and see something you haven't seen before. And afterwards, it's really difficult to put the spirit again into the, <laughs> to the bottle, you know? So uh, it's a sort of a awakening, uh, not necessarily spiritual, but something has been added which is there now and cannot be deleted in some way mm, yeah i'm done <laughs> yeah. I love hearing you say that because it just just right before you said that i was thinking about oh we catch ourselves on autopilot we catch ourselves doing something automatically and no longer is it are we, are our senses fresh? Our senses are in some kind of, but when that breaks, when that breaks, our senses are fresh then. So um, disruption is a wonderful word. Thank you. Yeah. And autopilot can also be in the sense of expectations of life, of worldview and everything, you know, and then there comes an information and you, uh, I've never known this. And now, what I do, will I do with this information? So it's, yeah, wonderful. Yeah. I'm really amazed how we put things together. It's, it's, I'm too lazy to write the, afterwards the, the, the timestamps, but we should do it and collect also in writing because otherwise you have to, to listen to more than an hour to, to have it together. I invite everybody or anybody to, to do that and collect the, the gems of what we bring together. It's really good. Maybe we could take turns doing that so it wouldn't it be a burden on one person. Mm -hmm. That would be good because I sort of ceased to do it because it became oh, too much. That's, yeah, then, then that's auto. that would take me to auto, right? Oh, I have to do this. <laughs> turn my machine. Turn my machine on right inside but if there was some way we could think about exploring sharing it because mm -hmm. i've often i mean i sometimes i try to take notes while we're in the session and i i can write and then look at the same time and then when i go back and look at the words i go what in the hell did i write <laughs> yeah 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 that's difficult <laughs> no, i always listened afterwards from the recording so we can do that as soon as it is published i would be happy and then we put it underneath and so everybody can have it. Yeah. Well, girls, we have done more than an hour in a wonderful way. It's, it's just amazing. 
And I thank you to be here with me from all over the world and that we can do our little part of trying to get clarity and transformation into the world. And happy Valentine's Day again. Happy to you. Thank I you. have one question to Heidi. Uh, how is your cat doing? My cat, is she sort of fine, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm grateful for you creating belonging for us. Thank you for allowing that to be in our That's lives. Wonderful uh, uh, exercise. And I make it short. I love you all. All these little pictures. <laughs> 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 Thank you.